this uh, I am Bill Whitford. Uh, there are programs for today that Michelle Preston over here, I'll say something about in a second, will hand out. There are a couple handouts for people who need them. If you raise your hand, uh, she's extremely efficient and the problem will be solved. Uh, so this uh, program, yes? Oh, you're just raising your hand for a program. Okay. Uh, this program has a title which is long, so I'll just let you read it on the screen. Uh, it is part of the uh, law school's 150th anniversary, year-long anniversary celebration. Uh, I want to initially uh, give a couple of thank yous. Uh, the, the program is funded by the Law School's Institute for Legal Studies. It's directed by uh, Associate Dean Susanna Tak, who stand, sits here in the front. The, Institute for Legal Studies is a very important institution in the law school, which in some ways, I would say, is an outgrowth of this period of the law school that we'll focus on today, but it's an outgrowth that continues. So I want to thank uh, the Institute for Legal Studies for their financial support and, importantly, for their administrative support. Michelle Preston, who's running around here with the programs, uh, is simply somebody that we've come to Count on uh, for and and Samudu Arapatu's back there works with Michelle because we just count on them to run things like this uh, set up do all the administrative and it becomes effortless for somebody like me or Bill Kloon and uh, at times I'm sure Samudu and Michelle we act like we take you for granted of course yeah. you'd be there but I want you to know you're not only is your help appreciated but your, the efficiency and expertise with which you do these things is noted and appreciated. Uh, now, there is a printed program that I guess you all have, so I don't really have to go through it. Uh, there, uh, and you'll note that uh, the, the prepared part is scheduled to end at 1.30. Before we we'll have discussion, uh, you'll need to speak into a mic. Uh, there are a couple mics around there. You can either stand up or maybe somebody can pass one around. But that'll be part of the Q and A. Uh, this is all. This is being recorded, and that's. And besides that, the acoustics here are such that if you don't speak into mic, some somebody won't <laughs> hear all your wisdom. Uh, the program uh, reflects uh, a belief I have and others have who participated in setting this up that there was a period in Wisconsin Law School's history, uh, maybe centered around the 60s and 70s, but with considerable overlap both before and after. Uh, when uh, there was a great deal of innovation and creativity uh, going on in lots of ways, but including, and this is the focus today, in the content of the class, the traditional classroom <laughs> curriculum. That Wisconsin Law School at the time stood out uh, nationally for doing something different, and it had an impact, it's a, the, the kind of work that was done in that time not only impacted other law schools at the time, uh, but has an impact down to this day in the annals of legal education. So that's the general concept. Uh, I won't say much more now. Uh, I can say more in the Q&A session if, if <laughs> I feel motivated and have time. <laughs> Uh, I'll now uh, call on our first presentation, uh, which is by my longtime friend and colleague, uh, Bill Clune, uh, who will provide an overview of what was going on at the law school during this period. So, Bill. Testing. So, hi, everybody. I'm Bill Clune, and uh, welcome to old and new friends and colleagues. Um, terrific to see you all. There's probably 50 or 60 years 
of people and tradition in this room. And when you're old like I am, I get a lot of some chills just thinking about it. So it's really good. Um, I, um, I prepared a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation with an audio narrative uh, to, to uh, play for you today. It takes about eight minutes. And um, it was because the program is so full, I didn't want to get into a lot of digressions. And so I'm going to uh, start that right now. And um, you can listen to it. And I think that'll lead nicely uh, into the rest of um, our very good program. Bill, you'll need Carlos's help here. Um, OK. Oh, I got locked out. That's what I was afraid of. OK. Good afternoon and welcome. My paper is about four innovative courses at Wisconsin created from 1950 to 1970 that reflected the goals of legal realism and law in action for law teaching. This will be a quick overview so that we can get to the next part of the program. Printed copies of the slides are available on the tables. All four courses continued at Wisconsin or nationally from that early time to the present. Willard Hurst considered the legal process book both as his first work in economic legal history and as one of the pioneers in legal process administrative law. He developed the course with Dean Lloyd Garrison, who had hired him and encouraged him to work on something different. This was innovation as a conscious policy, which was definitely true of the other courses as well. Here's a look at the hiring dates of the principals and when they began their work. Herman Goldstein started work with Frank Remington on the American Bar Foundation Survey of Criminal Justice in 1956. That study had a large influence on the Criminal Justice Administration course and on Goldstein's later work on problem-oriented policing. Stuart McCauley was working on the supplement that became the contracts course book when Bill Whitford was hired in 1965 and joined him in that effort. The main part of my paper identifies goals of legal realism, law in action, or law school teaching that are reflected in the four courses. All of the goals are intended to include aspects of legal practice and the legal system that are not well represented in appellate cases. Of course, legal realism was a criticism of classic Langdellian course books and doctrinal analysis of the kind that Hearst disliked at Harvard and referred to as Euclidean geometry. I focused on eight goals in the four Wisconsin courses. To save time, I'll give a couple of examples per goal, just naming them without discussion. First goal, major flaws of appellate decisions and legal reasoning. Examples, doctrine and counter-doctrine in contract, and policy bias of doctrine as a focus of legal history. Second goal, practical remedies versus theoretical rights. Examples, cost and uncertainty in contracts litigation and the large impact of the pretrial criminal justice system on ordinary citizens. This was a major finding of the ABA survey.
The third goal, law practice beyond courts. Examples, the legal process course itself with its emphasis on legislation and administrative law. Again, one of the early predecessors of the many courses that exist today. And police department regulation as limits on discretion. Such regulations were a major public policy contribution of the Wisconsin group. The fourth goal, discretionary decisions of lower public officials. Examples, low visibility discretion as the dominant characteristic of the criminal justice system and its counterpart, principled exercise of discretion by police, prosecutors, and lawyers as a main teaching objective of the criminal justice administration course. The fifth goal, private actors and lawyers' reactions to law. Examples, relational contracts with their many alternatives to litigation and organizational culture in policing. This is a broad category, including many legal transactions, organizational implementation, legal pluralism, and Ehrlich's living law. The sixth goal, change in legal policies over time in relation to society and economy. This is legal history and another broad category. What Willard Hurst called public policy in the dimension of time. Legal history is the only way to understand major legal change cutting across doctrinal areas. Hearst said it would be nice if law students understood how we got here. And legal history is about law in action, a study of the formation, operation, and consequences of law in real social contexts. Seventh goal, social needs, justice, legal reform, and political progressivism. Examples, dominance of the more powerful parties in contracts, progressive policy as a focus of legal history, and alternatives to incarceration, for example, problem-oriented policing. The eighth goal, empirical research, interdisciplinary collaboration, and joint and social science degrees. Empirical research was an essential foundation of all four of the courses. And then there was the major growth of interdisciplinary research more generally. For example, Malcolm Feely and Dirk Hartog. Okay, thanks, and on to the next part of the program, with our distinguished visitors and commentators. Thank you, Bill. And uh, the handout that you have there with the slides gives the uh, reference, I believe, to the SSRN. Uh, the paper as a whole is well worth reading, and you can find it on SSRN and download. Uh, now, uh, with this broad background, the organizers of the program couldn't cover everything, and uh, we were decided for a more in-depth critique and explanation, we'd focus on Willard Hurst's legal history work and Frank Remington's uh, criminal law, classroom, classroom courses in criminal law. Uh, we were fortunate enough we looked for some uh, people who were kind of inside out to come in who were familiar with this period but have been gone for a while and could provide <coughs> a little bit of an objective outsider's perspective. Uh, 
and uh, we found our first choices. They both <laughs> willingly accepted our invitations. They are uh, Dirk Hartog and Malcolm Feely. I'm uh, not going to go through their biographies because it's in your program uh, that they were both here uh, either during or just after this period and are familiar with it. Uh, they're both friends of mine and uh, so I want to express my <coughs> gratitude to both for making the effort to come to Madison on a sunny weekend. Uh, <laughs> we did our best to deliver that, but uh, so be it. Uh, the, the order of presentation will be uh, Dirk Hartog uh, on uh, the Legal History Program with a five-minute commentary to follow it by uh, Professor Mitra Sharafi, and followed by Malcolm Feely on the Criminal Law Curriculum with a five-minute commentary by Cecilia, Professor Cecilia, Cecilia Klingley, and then Q&A. So without further ado, Dirk Hartog. Yes, thank you. Thank you to Bill and Mitra for inviting me. Uh, thank you also to Bill Clune, whose conversations with me this summer were extensive and elaborate and uh, took me down this particular rabbit hole that I've gone down. So here's the bullet point of what I want to say. And then you'll get the longer version. There was at the one, there was at Wisconsin Law School in the 1950s and 1960s and 1970s, in large part, okay, sorry, I'll stop. <laughs> Can you all hear me? Okay, good. I guess I'm, if I, Anyway, here I am. Um, one, the other bullet points. There was at Wisconsin Law School in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, in large part because of Willard Hurst, an exciting and heterodox scholarly and pedagogical culture here. We should all be so lucky as to be part of such a moment and such a site. That moment, I think, still marks Wisconsin Law School. At least I hope it continues to do so. Certainly, I experienced that sense of being slightly at war with the legal establishment while still being paid during the years, basically the 1980s, when I was here. It was an experience I treasured and treasured. Two, at the same time, and this is what I have focused on in this work, the intellectual structures that shaped Willard Hurst's work was also defined by their times, by generational identities, and by genealogical linkages to older intellectual cultures. From historical distance, now, we may see him as more enmeshed in the legal conventions of that world, <coughs> less distinct from the orthodoxies Wisconsin's heterodox legal culture seemed to define itself against. It is, in any case, important not to overpraise, as I have in the past, or overstate the singularity of someone who David Trubeck on more than one occasion labeled St. Willard. I work to situate him in his historical moment. Three, and yet one should also learn from Hearst's engagement with his moment, as I've tried to do in the last part of this essay, both to offer continuing lessons for legal historical practices and pedagogy, and more importantly, to sketch what it means to be engaged in a heterodox intellectual and scholarly project about law. And fourth, here's where I begin, really. Willard Hurst thought long and hard about what legal history does, or to put it differently, what it means to do legal history. I fundamentally disagree with some portions of his perspective, or to put it differently, in writing this talk, and this is genuinely true, I discovered that I disagree. <laughs> and yet I have learned much from engaging with his thought. Okay, so I proceed. Um, let me give a kind of sideways introduction. Um, most historians know Bob Darnton's advice drawn from his study of the Great Cat Massacre in 18th century Paris. When you don't get what someone was doing, when something you read or examine, a joke or a practice or a text makes no sense, 
we may be able to unravel an alien system of meaning. And that's what I want to do with Hearst. To offer historical understanding means to take on and to decipher texts, passages, jokes, actions, and images that seem that are, how to put it, just wrong or, mis or stupid. The historian's task is not to make the joke funny, nor is it exactly to explain the joke. <coughs> it is certainly not to show how a joke then is like or connects to or offers a point of origin for what we find funny today. It is rather to situate that joke in its times. My intention here is to treat one work of Willard Hurst, his late book, Justice Holmes on Legal History, as if it were a great cat massacre. <laughs> Obviously, for those of you who know me and my relationship with Willard Hurst, which is closely entwined with my relationship with Wisconsin Law School, that is a weird, perhaps perverse goal. I always thought of Willard as a mentor, actually a dearly beloved mentor. His work has been my lodestar for close to half a century. My students, law students, undergraduate students, and graduate students have had Hearst imposed on them yearly for the 43 years I have been teaching. I would possibly not be a legal historian but for having come upon the work of Hearst when I was in law school. And to go farther, Hearst didn't live in some distant past, like when cat massacres <coughs> occurred. He was roughly the same age as my father. I knew him well during the years I taught at Wisconsin. He was an emeritus faculty member by then, but active and intellectually forceful. He and his wife, Frances, were very kind to Nancy and to me. This sort of Caesar, you know, Brutus talking to C about Caesar. <laughs> he was, when I first met him, only a bit older than the age I am now. I might add that in our many conversations, and this is relevant to what Bill, both Bills were, were talking about, um, Willard and I never talked much about the teaching of legal history. Um, I don't think he cared very much about law teaching. Um, and he was uninterested in educational experiments. He cared about his legislation course, and he believed strongly that law schools ought to focus on legislation rather than on the judiciary. He liked that the course he had co-created a generation earlier that Bill talked about that, that focused on the evolution of workmen's compensation law was called law in society. And he liked assigning and teaching a variety of set pieces in American political and constitutional thought. Um, debate between Jefferson and Hamilton, over the constitutionality of the Bank of the United States, almost everything that Hamilton wrote about economic policy, the Dartmouth College case, and the Charles River Bridge case, some homes, and a few other chestnuts. But teaching legal history didn't really interest him. It might, let me not overstate my distance from Hearst's understanding. In the last part of the talk, as I mentioned, I hope to return to some of what I believe might still be usefully drawn from the Hearst corpus. Hearst remains good to think with, even when much of one's thinking is against. Okay. Um, so I'm going to begin by just quickly sketching the main themes of this book, then I mark the way it belongs to a world of historical and legal th theorizing that is lost to us, and then I suggest that Hearst was more typical of his generation than we often think. Um, okay, in a, in a fit of arrogance, one could call this Hartog on Hearst on Holmes on legal history. <laughs> the three H's, <laughs> too much. Um, in the lectures that became Justice Holmes on legal history, Hearst used quotations from Holmes' judicial opinions and occasional writings. He didn't quote, actually, from Holmes' earlier explicitly historical writing that became the common law. These quotations allowed Hearst to reflect <coughs> on what legal history was as a useful practice. By practice, not a word either Hearst or Holmes used, um, I mark um, the notion that thinking through what they understood to be legal history allowed access to a broader and deeper understanding, both about the nature of law in America and of American history, full stop. What Hearst sought was something like the philosophical understanding that Holmes, in the last two pages of his famous essay, The Path of the Law, declared just out of reach of those who merely practiced law. He was not interested in making legal history useful. 
Hearst meant to articulate the meaning of American law. And for him, perhaps not for Holmes, that came close to being the meaning of America. I don't mean to suggest for a moment that Holmes and Hearst thought alike, and they certainly didn't write alike. Uh, Hearst, uh, Holmes was a much better writer. As Hearst regularly acknowledged throughout the text, Holmes was hostile to the middle class culture that lay at the heart of Hearst's understanding. Holmes also did not, according to Hearst, reflect hard about legislation. And Holmes was bored by the social science of his day, even as he acknowledged the emerging power of science and economics. By contrast, Hearst identified with the social science of his time, and he was immersed in functionalisms. While Holmes emphasized the centrality of will and the martial spirit, Hearst was not entirely immune to that as well, Hearst gave more weight to the inevitable fallibility and the failures that marked the lives and ambitions of willful men. He regularly pointed to the wastefulness that had long characterized American life. This was, of course, the core of his massive study of the legal destruction of the forests of northern Wisconsin, published just a year before the book that I'm, I'm talking about. And yet Hearst channeled Holmes for several purposes. He, too, focused on will, although often it translated into the language of individualism, and they shared much. Both were committed to understanding law as experience, which provided something like the organizing understanding for Hearst's whole book. To legal positivism, that is to understanding law as an expression of and an embodiment of the monopoly of legitimate violence in a society. And third, to what I might call a romantic anti-romanticism. That is both made a fetish of being tough and hard-headed. Mostly, though, Hearst read Holmes for his own purposes to make his own arguments. It is Hearst's book, not Holmes. Hearst's point of view, his understanding of the experience of American legal history began with two dyads. First of all, his approach took seriously both sequence and context, although he realized that they were often difficult to distinguish from one another. I'm going to say more here about his sequ sequencing than about his contextualizations, though I will return to the latter late in the talk. For the moment, suffice to say that his contexts are mostly cultural and economic generalizations, <coughs> not legal categories. Second, the substance of his understanding of both the sequential and the contextual relied on two categories, middle class culture and constitutionalism, or the constitutional ideal. Together, these two dyads, sequence and context and middle classness and constitutionalism, produced or organized the, continue, the book and the continuing content of American law. American law was, he thought, recognizably and continuously and distinctively American law across two centuries of American nationhood. That was his relevant sequence. The law that concerned him was not part of a still longer Anglo-American or common law or even longer Western sequence or tradition, nor did he ever think outside of the national context, not to imperial or colonial or post-colonial or globalized law or legal life. Nor was he interested in legal comparisons or transplants or in the transnational movement of legal ideas. It was always American law, in part because he minimized the juridical and emphasized the legislative, his legal history was the contingent con the consequence of American democracy or democratization. He did not care about the long history of a juridical culture of elite and non-elite professionals, of lawyers. He was derisively dismissive of questions of origins and the context for his sequence were produced by white male nationals, by voters, by those he regarded as relevant American citizens. Lawyers and other juridical actors were important to the sequence only insofar as they gave legal content to what we made of the law. He wrote constantly about what we made in and of the law, and his we, which I'm going to return to, always imagined a participatory community of American men who both made and were subject to the law they had made. The content of the legislative context was produced through a striving and individualistic and exploitative middle-class culture as it interacted 
with the conservatism of a constitutional culture that required law to serve public purposes. The content of the sequence, that is the content of what remained continuous over the course of American history, was what he called the strong producer orientation and the weak consumer interest. The, clearly, that would, would have been wrong in American history if he, if he carried the story forward. And that, he thought, resulted from a preoccupation with opening up a raw new continent. Indians, native peoples, were not surprisingly absent from this more than ternarian vision of Western expansion. A focus on sequence led him momentarily towards reflections on what were the core texts, we might say the archive of legal history, commitments found in a variety of legal documents. He mentions the Declaration of Independence, the Federal Constitution, the Louisiana Purchase, and Lincoln's call for volunteers put life into a sequence that could not be stopped. And one might say that is nearly all of what those documents did. For the rest, he's interested in a kind of cultural expectation rather than en what any particular documents or texts produce. <coughs> Hearst believed, as Holmes did, that a full understanding of the meaning of history was ultimately beyond our human capacities. Here, the influence of Niebuhr on Hearst <coughs> is manifest. Still striving to do legal history, Ben's effort towards realizing the creative potential that re resides in individuals and their society. Such explorations in time offers more than instrumental values. It feeds hungers which are part of our being. I, I won't try and signal every quotation because there's a lot of them. Um, <laughs> he then quoted Holmes in Holmes' most warlike voice from a speech to Harvard undergraduates. While their scope for achievement was necessary, narrowing, Holmes hoped that they, that is the Harvard students, still had the barbaric thirst for conquest and there is something left to conquer. <laughs> to do legal history is a little like making war. Hearst didn't disagree with Holmes on this, but his lectures moved in a different and seemingly less violent direction by identifying two time-rooted patterns of values and attitudes. One was the middle class point of view, the other was constitutionalism. For him, constitutionalism was only understandable as constraint and limit. Properly understood, constitutionalism disciplined the middle class attitude by requiring the articulation of public reasons for actions by self-interested individuals who were the primary makers of law. He acknowledged regretfully that constitutionalism sometimes became a fighting faith particularly when it emphasized zeal for group more than individual interests. Individualism became blunted because men worked to realize their aspirations more and more through group actions. He acknowledged the abolition of slavery as an exception, an instance when the constitutional ideal protected individuality. <coughs> but for the most part, mobilizations of the constitutional ideal expressed unattractive group interests. One should note, just obviously, something like footnote four in Caroline products just doesn't exist um, for him. He never even acknowledged the existence of discrete and insular minorities, let alone the problems they might pose for his generalizations. <coughs> and the fear of Lochner, of constitutional claims that would defeat reformist legislation, remained strong for him. One might almost say constitutive of his framework. For the most part, though, it was the middle class point of view that predominated. And the constitutional ideal succeeded mostly as a force that occasionally moderated and shaped that point of view. Quote, save for the tragedy of the Civil War, we contained the tensions of a mighty growth within the political process. The dynamic of this achievement was largely in our subscription to the constitutional ideal, which reduced protest to legalism except, of course, for the Civil War, a little detail. <laughs> but what he meant by the constitutional ideal was not at all the liberatory or emancipatory impulses that others would draw out of the 13th or 14th Amendments, as shaped by Lincoln's words in the reconfigured Declaration of Independence. Hearst quoted, without comment and with implicit approval, several of Holmes's many dismissive comments about the 14th Amendment. What was the middle class point of view? 
He emphasized its moral ambiguity or multiplicity, even as he embraced it as an organizing understanding. The legal historian needs the term precisely because it connotes diverse qualities and defects. What did it con connote? Independence of mind and will and creative energy, as well as capacity for waste and wrong. At its core was individualism and willfulness. He quoted Holmes again. The joy of life is to put one's power in some natural and useful or harmless way. There is no other way, and the real misery is not to do this. More important to act than to vainly attempt to love one's neighbor as oneself. Life is action, the use of one's power, and to use them to their height is our joy and duty, so it is the one end that justifies itself. And that led Hearst to expound on what he had earlier called the release of creative energy. And he tied that to scientific revolution, to discovery, and to enlarging markets. Hearst's description of the middle class point of view then becomes a pain. Pain, I don't actually know how to say that. P-A-E-A-N. <laughs> pain uh, to who we are and, who, and were. I want to return to the protean but constrained dimensions of this we in a moment. Right now, let us sink for a few moments into a few of the meanings of middle classness. We had faith in the creative potential of individual men and women. This is, by the way, one of the only mentions of women, if they were given a chance to show what they could do. Who the we there was is not clear. Not the individual men and women, but someone else, policymakers. We appreciated that man, here woman disappears, was a self-centered and passionate creature who could not be trusted with unlimited scope for his will. So how to deal with that? We extended the suffrage and generous, generously <coughs> endowed the legislative power. On the other hand, we put government under constitutions, emphasized the separation of powers, and developed informal checks and balances of party politics. So too, in providing a legal framework for private activity, we mingled encouragement and surveillance. He emphasized the law of property of, and contract of franchises. Delegations of power and dispersions of power were natural to the individualism, the activist bias, and the rational skepticism of the middle class point of view. Although there would be some movement, that is to say, we groped, towards public controls of private power, for the most part, law was used to promote expansion rather than to limit expressions of private energies and will. We counted on market processes rather than politics. We, he continued, pursued our faith in manipulation and contrivance to increase yields from nature and from social relations. In other words, we exploited both the environment and one another, that is, other human beings. In particular, that meant that men were free to experiment with the structure and uses of the business corporation. And corporations and corporate law served him as a recurrent example. Um, five years later, he would publish a book on the legal history of the corporation. Um, gradually, we became uneasily conscious that such unrestrained experimentation left us dependent on large-scale private organizations. After some floundering in what he called the romantic period of 19th century politics, the 20th century saw a return to the realism of the founding fathers, and so forth. Middle class men were striving men who directed their striving within the realm of present experience. In our 1994 <coughs> interview and conversation, he and I argued a lot about whether that focus on present experience meant necessarily selling out the future in the pursuit of short term advantage. <coughs> I've come to think of his we, which has yearly been a subject of ridicule among my graduate students, <laughs> as more than a rhetorical quirk. Obviously, his we excluded many, most of the American population. It, we, was white men. One might say those he recognized as striving individuals and consumers of law. No native peoples, no women, no one who could not participate fully in 19th or early 20th century political society. It's hard to know if he would have included Catholics or those who worked with their hands. For us, living in the 21st century, what leaps out with his we are the absences all the others who constituted America at any moment in American history. The consequences of those exclusions was a radically narrowed understanding of what the subjects of legal history are and were. <coughs> Corporate charters, but not the enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Acts, 
not the expropriation of native lands, not domestic violence laws, not apprenticeships, and not indentured labor. The household and the family he imagined was, for the most part, a non-legal domain. All this may seem obvious, and I, I, th I know I'm just pre preaching to the choir, but I have to add that these absences retain a really paradoxical quality for me, because what Hearst and Wisconsin legal history long stood for in my mind and in the minds of many legal historians of my generation was the widening of legal history to incorporate the whole of social experience. Did I, did we legal historians just misread him all those years? On this reading also, what strikes me even more than the exclusions is how chaotic and mysterious his we was. His we were the makers of law, that is, I think, preeminently voters and legislators, but his we were also the political movements and the persons, including corporations, that elected legislators legislators and produce the initiative for legislative products. His we were also clients and consumers of laws, those who used facilitative laws and were regulated or disciplined by some laws. Sometimes his we became social scientists and historians. For example, early on in his chapter on context, he cautioned us to avoid fallacious metaphors as explanatory devices and not to over-organize explanations by focusing on a multiplicity of explanations. Doing so might tempt us towards unreality. His we were not, for the most part, lawyers, certainly not creative lawyers, finding novel or integrative tools to represent the previously unrepresented. Lawyers perhaps reproduced or translated the individualistic wants of his collective we, but not much else. Much of the time his we was or is a pretty godlike presence, a kind of Unitarian god, I suspect, knowing him, or an invisible hand that directs the society, us, in its undirectable way towards an expression of individual freedom. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit. I am, I'm struck also by the way his we floats across generations and periods. There's really no periodization within his sequencing. There is an implicit movement as the economy grows in scale. There was a gradual evolution from island communities towards the national regulations he and others identified and loved in the New Deal. But the we remains continuous and unchanged. No parties, no race conflict, no populist crisis, no waves of immigrants, almost no progressives, no labor movements. In this, his writing is quite similar to what was being produced as American studies at that time a field in part defined by its similar but more explicit rejection of the conventional periodizations of American history. <coughs> okay, that's part one. Part two. Um, I've long lived within the faith that Wisconsin Law School was different. And it is, right? Here it is. Um, certainly that is how I understood it during the years I lived and worked in Madison, a place unlike other law schools where serious and critical inquiry about law was possible, a shining light that was marked by its differences, its distinctive identity within the constellation of American law schools. And the reason why it was different or distinctive was for me in large part because of Willard Hurst. And yet, I want to emphasize a few of the ways that the Willard Hurst of Justice Holmes on legal history was a man of his time, of a piece with other elite white law professors, being male didn't have to be said, um, or to put it more directly, in significant ways, his thought belongs to a generation of elite lawyers, legalists, now gone. Let me start with what is most striking, shocking even, about reading Justice Holmes on legal history. Here was a summation of his understanding of American legal history, written and published in 1965, produced, that it was spoken in lectures at Iowa, then written up and published by a major commercial publisher of the time, Macmillan, he was probably incorporating summary phrases that he had used in his lectures and courses here at the law school in the midst the heyday of the civil rights movement. This is 1965. And yet this was a summation without anything about the history of race in America. Nothing about slavery, nothing about freedom struggles. Abolitionists and women's rights do not appear. Likewise, nothing about native people or borderlands nor anything about immigration restriction or exclusions. 
there is one bland mention of white Southerners as an organized interest group. The challenge that Brown versus Board of Education raised for conventional constitutional thinking, a challenge that was ubiquitous and a matter of constant discussion at that 1965 moment, doesn't appear. The only notice given to the 14th Amendment draws on Holmes's dyspeptic thoughts about its insignificance. The 13th Amendment doesn't appear. It is conventional to identify Hearst with Wisconsin. Doing so you know, might be said to excuse him and his exclusions and omissions by identifying with the state and with the predominantly white northern Midwest. He was, one might suggest, just writing about what he knew. But that's nonsense and radically inconsistent with the knowing and sophisticated person he was. He knew and he excluded, I think intentionally, knowingly, one might even say brutally. His context bleached out context he must have known of but that he chose not to discuss, that consciously or unconsciously he regarded as irrelevant to the themes that concerned him. Race, struggles against Jim Crow, as well as expropriation of Indian lands, messed up the analysis. If he had taken those seriously, he would have had to reconstruct his thought radically. A second related, perhaps smaller, but equally shocking point. Hearst worked to characterize the overarching policies that shaped law, this in his discussion of context, and again in his final chapter on the logic of law. He claimed that one could reduce law's concerns to three functional domains, natural <coughs> resources, human nature, and society. With regard to the first of these, he reduced the history of the environment in the following way. He began in classic Turnerian fashion as always ignoring the presence of native peoples. Because we were on a, again, we were on a naturally rich, long underpopulated and unexploited content, continent, we learned to be concerned with what he called the physical and biological bases. And that led to giving land title a prominent place in legal development. But it also led to a desire for population increase, which meant for him easy immigration, favoring the family farm and supporting urban growth. That's a fairly banal and inexplicit list. But he continued, we only pushed for activities that promised quick and easy gains. Eventually, he continued, we would learn to protect the environment. That was genuine progress from his perspective. And for him, that included reforms that provided for the health, safety, and the self-respect of men and women. Again, women do appear there. And even the genetic soundness, that's a quote of the human population. This passage then concluded with a footnote that blandly cited to Holmes's infamous opinion in Buck v. Bell, where Holmes defended eugenic forced sterilizations. <coughs> this was, of course, the opinion that included the odious phrase, three generations of idiots are enough. Sixty pages and one chapter later, Hearst returned to the theme. He agreed with Holmes that one could not do much to change, quote, the lot of the mass of men by rearranging legal institutions of property. Holmes had called the notion that it was possible to use property law to produce an economic paradise twaddle. For both of them, apparently, the true sources of material improvement lay in more rational control of population increase and in implying men's organization, organizing genius to the means made available by science and technology. It would be a better legislative strategy, Hearst wrote, to improve the quality than to increase the quantity of the population. Again, the passage concluded with a footnote to Buck v. Bell. Now, I don't believe that Hearst was a racial eugenicist. His point was rather that Buck v. Bell was an ordinary police power decision, founded on plausible, that is, rationally defensible legislative grounds. Hearst didn't have to like forced sterilizations. I don't know what he thought about it one way or another. It wasn't his business to challenge or critique so long as to use his frame of reference. Legislation, the mobilization of the violence of the positive state, was founded on overarching pop policies that properly shaped American law. It goes without saying that Hearst was very different from the legal process scholars who became the dominant intellectual forces in the mainstream American law schools in the 1950s and 1960s. He had little interest in formal processes, in the separation of powers. 
He didn't obsess about administrative discretion in the post-New Deal state, and he was not interested in the question of the judicial role and the functions and place of the least dangerous branch or the problems of the counter-majoritarian institution. It might be said, as Bill Clune does, <laughs> um, that he continued the legal realist project of the 1920s and 1930s as it was abandoned or qualified by legal process scholars. He fundamentally rejected the obsession of legal process scholars with fine-grained readings of Supreme Court opinions. He was ever the anti-doctrinalist. And yet he remained marked, like they were marked, both by the inheritance of progressive legal thought and, I would suspect, by the Cold War. How to think about rights when rights were understood as the possession of alien corporate interests or as ways of constraining or limiting reform. More how to think about rights when the New Deal and World War II had transformed the relationship in, between rights and reform. All of them, legal process scholars and Hearst alike, continued to, avo to view those questions through a lens that posed constitutional rights as the enemy of democratic processes. Unlike Hertz, <coughs> the legal process scholars obsessed about Brown, but that was because they regarded the work of the Supreme Court <coughs> as their core subject, unlike Hearst, who wanted to write about America. That is, Hearst was different than they in many ways. The legal process variant of modernism, as Kunal Parker is developing in brilliant new work, was different from his modernism. He remained, I suspect, more true to the progressive heritage and to his mentors, Frankfurter and Brandeis. But like other elite lawyers of his generation, he really didn't care about race, and the Cold War was a continuing presence. The Cold War shaped him, leaving him reluctant to embrace collective solutions, anxious to mark himself as not a radical. He was afraid of or cool to socialism or social reform, even as he um, supported many reforms that were celebrated in a progressive Wisconsin. He was not interested in the ways that rights could be marked or shaped by the language and the activities and the mobilizations of subordinated classes. One of the striking moments in my interview with him occurred early on when I noted that his course had become a mandatory one for many of the new left history graduate students who then populated the history graduate program at the University of Wisconsin. He was dismissive of their interests and their interest in law, and he made it clear that their education was not a matter of concern to him. <laughs> it, it, by 1965, his understanding, like that of other elite men who produced what might be called this predominant post-war understanding, was already under challenge, not only by the civil rights movement, but by black power and soon Indian power and the women's movement, by the free speech movement, by the new left, and by emergent practices of the discipline of history. Consensus history fragmented. The idea of America as a civilization became an archaic artifact. Such understandings were being challenged by the fragility of their own premises as well as by contemporary events. So in, in a certain way, by 65, Hearst was already oddly out of date. His, his we must have read as odd um, to his audience when he delivered the talks to the University of Iowa Law School. Okay, let me quickly try and say a little bit about what is left of Hearst's legal history. Um, actually, a lot, I think. I want to hold on to his notion of the collective power of the middle class point of view. In the face of the apparent fracturing of notions of a common or a hegemonic culture, see my colleague Dan Rogers' book, The Age of Fracture, in contrast to the ubiquitous pluralisms and postmodernisms of contemporary intellectual legal life, there's a refreshing quality to how Hearst unified his imagined legal history. It's easy to reframe Hearst's middle class perspective as describing the hegemonic power of a particular, lumpy, incompletely articulated, but clearly exclusive and powerful understanding of law as it was experienced by a diverse and multitudinous range of Americans. This is what Barbara Welke provided in her celebrated law and the, bo the borders of belonging. There was, she would say, a powerful we that ruled American law. It did so in large part by excluding others, knowingly so. Law set the ground rules for who belonged and who did not belong in the society. One might add that much of American constitutional history, certainly the constitutional history of post-Civil War America, 
has been defined by the struggles of those excluded, of those who did not belong to find a kind of belonging, including citizenship and the capacity to mobilize rights. Yet it is a mark of the power of that culture that those who did not immediately belong to the dominant class, to the middle class, knew that they had to find ways to participate in core features of middle class culture, to reveal identities that might properly be called <coughs> middle class identities. Much of the time, if not all of the time, that meant reproducing aspects and features of middle classness. We have today a wider and deeper portrait of how constitutionalism worked, occasionally and intermittently, to challenge middle class culture. Any fair understanding of the coercive cultural power of American law as a historical phenomenon would have to add much on the incompleteness of that hegemonic power, its susceptibility to challenges. The cracks and fissures in the legal culture, its inability to impose uniformity or clarity, are at least as important as the singularity of it as a continuing historical presence. <coughs> what strikes me is of enduring significance in Hearst's portrayal of American law. What excited me when I came upon it in the early 1970s, and what excites me still, is first of all his willingness to, law, to look at law as a human activity that takes its form across doctrinal silos. He made law seem crucial and important as a site for serious historical inquiry into American life. I, I, my naivete about that may still be part of the story as well. Even as he professed a lack of interest in legal education, his work fundamentally challenged the conventional wisdoms of doctrinal law teaching. Legal doctrine was probably more important than Hearst acknowledged. He was such a good lawyer himself, so good at conventional legal analysis, that he deprecated it as a skill and a frame for historical analysis. But his willingness to imagine legal fields as united by common problems and by a shared culture, by a common context, stimulated a kind of work, a legal history, that crossed and transformed. Once again, I'm struck by the absence of any awareness of periodization in his contextualizations. To me, it seems obvious that things happen at a particular time and not at any other. Um, all that law from varying doctrinal sources mobilized across the middle years of the 19th century to cut down all those trees in northern Wisconsin at the least cost. All that law could not possibly have been mobilized earlier during the late 18th and early 19th century, and most of us would look with shock at the results at the denuded landscape today, as progressives did by the early 20th century yet not for Willard Hurst. It's something of a mystery to me how Hurst so deeply understood the power of contexts that cut across legal fields while not understanding those contexts as knowable only historically, that is, by making their history specific and precise, that is, by periodizing. But still, without a desire to find context, to find formulations that identified what joined together various streams of legal understanding or doctrine, streams that conventional legal education sought to keep apart in silos, one cannot know how law has worked in this culture. And for that, Hearst showed the way. I particularly liked his phrasing at one point when he referenced what happened when 19th century statutes interfered with commerce or with the commerce, a contract clause. All rights, he wrote, are limited by the neighborhood of principles of policy, which are other than those on which the particular right is founded. In some ways, he continued, the notion of the police power, as it was elaborated over the course of the long 19th century, was in its nature a challenge to doctrinal silos. And second, and finally, and I will stop in a moment, I want to celebrate his focus on contingency. Here's a quote again. The life of the law represents no homeostatic, functionally self-adjusting process, but the product of the qualities and defects of men's will, imagination, and feeling." That meant for him that all law is and was fundamentally legislative in character, by which he meant that the secret root from which the law draws all the juices of life is considerations of what is expedient for the community concerned. In that sense, one might say, he would definitely not have said it this way, it was all and always politics, all the way down, even if he seemed unconcerned with party politics. 
And that led him to a critique of what he called organic metaphors of evolutionary portraits of legal change. Middle classness may have defined all or much of the law at many moments of American history. But what those middle class manifestations of law were or would be depended on the contingent acts and decisions of many men and institutions, many men and women and institutions, who differed and fought about many things, not on any imagined evolutionary necessity. No reading of the Hearst Corpus of the Hurstian corpus can escape a sense of the constant and continual underlying presence of those struggles. And in that sense, his writings prefigure the strongest features of what became critical legal studies, even if he wrote in a different, more Protestant or Unitarian and often functionalist register. I'll stop there. Thank you. <coughs> And we now have Professor Mitra Sharafi with some comments on that. Wonderful. Thank you. Is, is this working? Yes? Um, it doesn't sound like it's working to me. Yeah. Is this working? Yes. OK, great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dirk. Um, <coughs> for your take on Willard Hurst. Um, I just have three uh, relatively quick things uh, that I want to say, three comments. The first thing is, um, uh, I'm not sure if everyone here is aware of um, uh, just how important the name of Hurst is in many of the kind of central institutions that exist in our field of legal history today. The, the Law and Society Association, the big uh, legal history book prize, it's called the Hearst Book Prize, it's named after Hearst. Um, the Hearst Summer Institute in Legal History, which is a wonderful program every two years, um, uh, which, I, which I just I directed in 2017, and which Dirk used to direct, is called the Hearst Summer Institute. Um, and so uh, we last, last time the Hearst Institute happened, we start uh, the two-week sessions by reading about Hearst. I actually agonized over whether we should read Hearst or read about Hearst. And in the end, we read this wonderful interview that Dirk Hartog did with Willard Hearst um, in the Law and History Review, 1994, called Snakes in Ireland. Um, if, you haven't, if you haven't read it, you might want to take a peek because it's, really, it's, it's, um, it's a very nice take on Hearst. And we, we, we read that. Um, and I just thought I would share with this group some of the, some of the uh, w discussion that, that came up in the Hearst Institute last two summers ago. Uh, like Dirk, we were struck by the exclusionary we. Um, we were struck by the absence of uh, concern with race and gender um, in Hearst's work. Uh, we were perhaps not surprised by this. I, I realize, um, Dirk, you've just made the point that by the 1960s, um, lots was happening. Uh, in terms of new um, awareness of all of these, um, uh, all of these themes, and yet Hearst didn't seem to really incorporate that in his work. But in the 1960s, he was in his 50s. He was born in 1910. He was appointed here uh, to the faculty in 1937. So uh, I suppose our group <coughs> was not necessarily surprised. He was not at a kind of formative intellectual stage of his life, I suppose, during the, the social movements of the 1960s. Um, we were also struck by his lack of interest in the history of the legal profession and case law, which Dirk, you talked about. That was interesting and kind of surprising to some of us. Um, and we were very struck at the level of uh, what it's like to be an academic by um, how opportunities and grants seem to have come into <laughs> Willard Hurst's <laughs> life because he had this incredible uh, stream of funding from the Rockefeller Foundation for many, many years, and it seems to have come out of a in-person conversation, it seems. Yeah. It, it doesn't, doesn't work like that Frank anymore. Frank. Right, so, yeah. yeah, so obviously that has, that has changed, and the Hurst <coughs> Fellows uh, noticed that very clearly, <laughs> unsurprisingly. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, the, the third, let's see, the third thing that I want to say is I just want to comment a little bit about Hearst and legal history at the University of Wisconsin today. Today and in the future, perhaps. So today at UW, there is lots of legal history going on, um, but uh, much of it is not focused on the U.S. So there are those of us who work on South Asia. Um, we have Carl... Shoemaker in the history department who works on medieval Europe. 
We have Joe, De Joe Dennis in the history department who works on China. Um, and so uh, it's very interesting that um, most of the legal history that is taught on this campus today is not taught in the law school, I would argue. It's taught outside of the law school for undergraduates in the legal studies program um, and in the history department. Uh, I believe the last time the kind of official American legal history survey was taught, I think Art McAvoy is perhaps sitting in the back, um, that was his course in 2007. So then there have been kind of seminars here and there that have been taught with a legal history angle, American legal history angle since then, but a as, a, as an official kind of survey course, it no longer exists at the UW Law School, which is kind of interesting given our tradition and, and the legacy of Hearst. So um, now here's my kind of theory and, and question. I don't know if you'll agree or not, Dirk, and everyone in this room, but um, I wonder if this development, not just at UW, but also in the larger field of legal history, which is also kind of globalized in its subject matter, uh, I can see that uh, this is kind of an extension of a pattern that Hearst made possible. So legal history as it's developed in the US under Hearst's influence takes this um, outside of the box approach. He had this wonderful line about um, how he was trying to, uh, trying to counter this uh, vision of law as a, this tail eating system of the law as a self enclosed system. And so before Hearst I really see um, law faculty who wrote about legal history as writing about how legal doctrine developed over time. And then historians who use legal sources would probably most often have uh, used those sources to mine um, interesting social data, but they're really writing social history with it. They weren't necessarily that interested in the law itself. What Hearst did was he, he brought these two kind of constituencies together, and he created a, a, a socially um, contextualized legal history. And that is kind of the model of legal history in this country ever since. So he's had just an incredible influence. If you look at a place like the UK, you still see um, that it's not like that. And people who write in law faculties are doing the kind of history of doctrine and are not interested in social context sometimes. Um, and then the historians may not necessarily be that interested in law, even though they're using legal sources. So, so Hearst's influence, um, it has just become part of our culture and the way that we do things, especially since the rise of scholars with dual law and history training. Um, and so as legal history uh, becomes a kind of shared enterprise amongst lawyers and historians, and as, as, as it moves into history departments in that form, I think there's a greater chance, I mean, history departments tend to be more global in, in the subject matter that they study than law schools. So it's not surprising that we get this globalizing um, subject matter as well. And then we sort of end up in the place we are today where most of the legal historians on campus are not working. People who identify front and center as legal historians do not work on, on the US anymore. Um, so there's this unexpected side effect, perhaps, of Hearst's approach to open the way to globalize the subject matter and then to have the teaching migrate out of law schools. And so I'd like to just end with the question, what is the value of legal history, both US legal history and non-US legal history, on the UW Law School curriculum today. Thank you very much. Uh, next we have my friend uh, Malcolm Feely. Uh, and I'll give him no more introduction. Okay. Can you clip that on me? I'll let you do it. I'll let you do it. Better. You but I can You'll do it better than I can. I can't see it. Okay, do you hear me? Yes. <laughs> well, I'm going to talk real fast uh, to, to make up uh, for time. Um, I want to begin with a story. Uh, for 15 years, I used to read everything that was published by a very well-known scholar of criminal procedure. I'd read it. I'd read it carefully and I kept wanting to learn from it because he was regarded as, as uh, one, of, one, of, one of the leading figures. What he was trying to do was take constitutional criminal procedure and shape it or propose how it be shaped so it could, uh, it could be a jacket that 
police officers could wear and that and that prosecutors could wear that would govern that would govern their behavior. He wanted to come up with a management system for for governing the police and prosecutors and was working on 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 uh, on constitutional criminal procedure to to do it. Uh, I finally gave up thinking that he was wasting his time and I was wasting my time. Sometime after that, I walked by the, the open door of a colleague of mine and realized he was good friends with Professor X. So I popped my head in the room and asked, has Professor X ever talked to a police chief? Long pause, and my colleague, probably not. Well, Professor X should have spent some time in Wisconsin. He would have had police officers in his class. He certainly would have met police chiefs. He would have ri ridden around with police, uh, with police officers. His students would have. And he would have learned something about police training manuals, command and control structures within in the police, uh, uh, the exercise for discretion in a variety of ways. He would have actually learned something about he was trying uh, about the topic that he was trying to create a management system for. He had wasted his career. I really I really I really I really do uh, I really do uh, think 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 that. <coughs> Which brings me to Professor Remington. In an earlier draft of my comments I was going to tell you how original and daring I thought Professor Remington was. And then I reflected on it. I read some of the things. Now I've heard, now I've heard, now I've heard, now I've heard, I've heard, I've heard Dirk. And I realized that he was not all that original. He had come to this law school. He had studied and been a, been a, been a protege of Wilhurst. And he learned how to sing on Wisconsin. <laughs> he was committed to the perspective that we've already, we've already talked about. What is distinct is that when he went out on the field, to, to the marching field to sing on Wisconsin, he found an area that Will Hurst had not exploited. He turned to the criminal process, although I'll point out in a moment it was Willard Hurst that directed him there. So, so that, so this was this, this, this was his, this was his, 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 his distinct. Now, how do I know that? Well, when I read Bill's wonderful paper, I went back and picked out my book, *The Legal Process* by, you know, the great men, uh, and and my copy says March, 1965, University of Minnesota, exactly 15, 55 years ago uh, this uh, uh, th this month. And I, and, I, and I look at that. It's published in 1961. Frank was up and running by 1961. He didn't read this text. But then I read the details about the text. Two things are important. One is the book first appeared in materials with Garrison and, and Hearst in 1941. So Frank clearly was in that class and was up and, 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 and running. Second thing I think that is at least important for, for Frank, I don't know if it did, I don't know how much it was for, for, uh, for, for, for Will, is in the preface here, in the preface, there is only one person mentioned at any length. It's not an iconic law professor, it's not an iconic lawyer, it's not an iconic judge. It's Chester I. Barnard, who was the father of modern management theory not 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 the you know not not the fordist uh, uh, you know time and motion study but management theory that says that management is the art of managing men and women in complex institutions harnessing their energy to the same energy a sort of a, a sort of hurstian vision on on in an institu in an institutional setting Chester Barnard, and I, th I don't know whether you can tell me whether Hearst was influenced by this. Certainly, I think indirectly, uh, indirectly uh, 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 Frank had to be. Barnard was influenced by John Dewey. Dewey's notion of law 
is not, it is not that it's an institution that we, or a set of rules or principles that we apply or not apply. His view of law is that in institutional settings, we have to solve problems. And laws and principles are the institutions, are, are, are the vehicles by which complex problems are solved and particularly complex institutional problems are solved. So there's a, there's a Deweyan notion of, of law that at least underlies, under, underlies Frank. And, it, and incidentally, uh, uh, um, in, in this book, there is a section on Brown versus Board of Education. But so in that sense, maybe wrong. But on the other hand, it's primarily a celebrating the dramatic and innovative, innovative use of remedies. Uh, to that 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 that, were, were, that 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 flowed in the after after aftermath aftermath of uh, uh, of Brown, so so <coughs> so what's 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 my response uh, uh, is is I've already suggested that I think that that somewhere along the line. Uh, uh, Frank, maybe Herman, maybe you know Frank uh, was influenced and very directly by. Uh, maybe you were the influence on that. Uh, Ch Chester Barnard's sense of, of sensible, important management and and and, and, the, and the Dewey and, and the Dewey and indeed maybe maybe the celebrated book that uh, that uh, that Frank and various colleagues, including Herman, uh, uh, put put out on the Criminal Justice Administration, may have simply been another part of this book. This book talks about contracts and torts and, the, and, 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 had a, and it had to deal with, uh, uh, with injuries and it moves from common law to legislation to administrative agency. And Frank's parallel book on the administration of criminal justice is with his co great colleague here, Herman, uh, moved from common law to legislation to the administration of criminal justice parallelism. So maybe he saw a weakness or an incompleteness in this book, and 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 takes us his takes us his uh, takes us his uh, his his management scheme 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 this. But he still owed an important an important uh, important. Uh, 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 debt to, 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 to Wilhurst. Frank zips through undergraduate, he zips through law school in, in, in two years, two and a half years. He has six months, he's between January, uh, when he finishes law school, he's been offered a job uh, here, but it starts in, it starts in, uh, in, in, in the fall, uh, uh, six months later. Uh, he has uh, two children, maybe one of them is back here, I don't know, T two children to feed, Will Hurst, uh, always, always the helpful person, uh, sends him off to Michigan to work for William Dawson. Maybe Will wanted him to move into contracts as well because he was dealing with the, with the overlap of contracts and torts when he went there. Dawson uh, is working on unjust enrichment. Okay? Well, what is, what, Frank, an unjust enrichment? What do we, Dawson sends him off to the criminal courts in Detroit. Dawson has a hunch. Prosecutors are using criminal prosecution, not criminal prosecution, but rather the threat of pr criminal prosecution to force unscrupulous creditors to reimburse or to make restitution to their victims. So epiphany, epiphany. Here you see criminal prosecution not criminal prosecution, the threat of criminal prosecution used to a laudable social end. So he's hooked on criminal law, I think, and he's hooked on discretion. It's the, it's, it's the non-application of criminal prosecution uh, that, that, is, that is interesting to him. He comes back, he dives in immediately to the Wisconsin Legislative Commission. He works with, uh, with, with, with Margot Melly and Orrin or, 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 uh, uh, Helstead to, uh, to, to create a, a, a legislative code, a criminal code, again, following the, uh, following the model of, uh, of, of his mentor. Uh, this brings him to the attention of, Herm uh, of, of Herbert Wexler. Uh, he's engaged with the model penal code through the, through the, uh, through the uh, American Law Institute. One thing leads to another. In 1953 or 1954, he's approached about dealing with this massive uh, project. 
the origins of this project are Byzantine and huge. Uh, 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 just, just as uh, 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 Robert H. Jackson gives a talk, somebody listens to it, it mobilizes the ABA and one group after another, the newly formed uh, American Bar Foundation, perhaps formed in part because of Jackson's comment, uh, uh, mobilizes. They get the Ford Foundation uh, to uh, interested, and slowly but surely, the idea of a the idea of a of a new American survey of criminal justice administration is important. It's a response to uh, to studies that that had that had taken place uh, uh, twenty to thirty years earlier. Uh, uh, the various surveys of, of the various surveys of criminal justice. Uh, in various various communities across the state, the one that is still the one that is still read from time to time today is the one by Roscoe Pound and and, and Felix Frankfurter on the administration of of, of of the criminal process in in Cleveland. The reaction to these studies were they all took official records. They culled official records to try to get a picture of the way the criminal justice was administered. And it was incomplete. Uh, uh, let me give one example. In the, in, in the Pound and Frankfurter study, you might see 100 cases, there are 100 arrests, and only 50 prosecutions, and only 30 convictions. Well, there's a problem here. There were 50 unnecessary arrests. The police either made mistakes or the prosecutors were careless or lazy and, and didn't bring the case forward. Similarly, uh, 50, 50, only, 30, only 30, uh, uh, 30 convictions out of 50, more like 20 convictions out of 50, 50, 50 prosecutions. Something's wrong here, too. This was the sort of lessons that were being taught by, by, by the administration. Frank knew that the... That, that the decision not to invoke or not to inv press further in the criminal process itself is a useful and important decision and cannot be inferred, it cannot automatically be inferred that it's a negative, it's a negative, uh, it's a negative uh, uh, decision. And I think that's, that's, that's letting. Anyway, the, the connection between Justice Frankfurter, I mean, sorry, Justice Jackson and the ABA and the ABF and, and so on eventually led to the creation of the American Bar Foundation Survey of the Administration of Justice. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the, uh, with the uh, CLRP, the, the Cost of Litigation Project? That's the great one that we were around. Okay, or you know a little bit about it. I don't see you raising your hand, Stuart. You certainly didn't. Uh, <laughs> The ABF project in today's dollars was somewhere between eight and ten times the size of CLRP. And when I was around, CLRP was overwhelming and people were drowning in the administration and the problem. This was a massive, this was a massive, massive, massive project. It was, and this was only to be the pilot program. They started in three states, so they had and, and, and ambitions to go to 50. Uh, needless to say, uh, they they stopped at the uh, they stopped at the at the three states. At any rate, Frank had found his calling to investigate the criminal process in action. It's something different. It's something different than as I, as I was listening to listening to uh, hear to about about uh, uh, to Dirk about about uh, uh, Will Hurst. It's something different because. The criminal process, by definition, is almost it is about using legal means to control, to regulate, to draw in, to manage uh, this ambition to, you know, to uh, uh, to repress crime. So, it, so in that sense, it's a it's a it's a distinct it's distinct from 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 her central concern. I think maybe maybe we can come back and, and, and discuss that. Uh, but Frank, Frank, was, Frank was clearly the protege of, of, of Will. There's one difference. There's one difference, really. And, and, and I think those of you, certainly the, the, the two sons that are in here will know. Uh, will Hurst was a generous mentor, had many proteges, and was generous beyond to believe. He, me, when I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I was here. Uh, but he was a solo practitioner in his writing, by and large. Uh, Maybe it's, uh, but Frank was just the opposite. Frank was big, 
gregarious. He was the captain of a huge and ever-expanding team. And 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 he ran he he ran he ran his projects I think like w w with this. Uh, second of all, Frank was more of a doer than a writer. He wrote plenty, but much of his writing is co-authored, and others of his writing are various uh, reports to particular agencies and to particular commissions and, and, and the like. He did not he didn't he did not he did not uh, uh, tolerate. So Frank assembled a team of researchers to pursue his, this huge uh, project in, 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 in the three states. Uh, he hired on, early on, I tell you, uh, 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 he hired, uh, had the good sense to hire Lloyd Olin, who, uh, who uh, was a protege of Everett Hughes at the University of Chicago, who, was the, who was, that did the field research that was, I mean, had pioneered the field research that was, that was used in the study. And then he, he had the immense good sense to hire, to hire Herman Goldstein, who had a background in public administration and this is exactly what the administration of the criminal justice needs, is someone that can think about it in terms of public administration rather than only constitutional criminal procedure. So that's, 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 that, that's what he did. Uh, uh, he, uh, I think they, br they brought Frank and, Frank and Lloyd and Herman brought him here. They gave him a crash course in research. They gave him a bus, they gave him a bus ticket, patted him on the back, and sent him out to their various sites. Uh, I think uh, uh, it was a bit like the researchers were a bit like district commissioners of the Ottoman Empire. They used to send back they used to send back their reports. They were never sure whether anyone ever opened. They got there whether anybody opened them, whether anybody read them, and they didn't quite know didn't, didn't quite know what what, what was what. Uh, uh, one researcher I told in one of one of the accounts uh, uh, came you know met the met the uh, a Ford Foundation uh, program officer, and said, "This is a total waste of time. Nobody knows what they're doing. It's chaos." And the program officer gave a typical uh, Ford Foundation program officer <laughs> response: "It doesn't matter. We're investing in people." I think he was absolutely right in, 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 in this case. <clears throat> now, for several summers, they would bring the researchers back, and they'd bring the, they'd br they and, and, and they would they would have the institutes here. And they would also invite invite uh, uh, other people to come in for the one institute. I think I uh, I read this book in a political science class at the University of Minnesota in part because I think uh, my professor had spent one of those summers in the institute here and, and and picked it up. At the institutes, they also invited they also invited a lot of other people. Now, what strikes me as really interesting is the two. The two single most famous articles stemming from this project were written by people that had the least to do with it. Frank was generous, maybe beyond a fault. Those two people are Joe Goldstein and his ar famous article on the low visibility of police discretion. The, that was his tenure article at Yale. And the other was my, was my, my colleague. Actually, both of them at one point or another were colleagues and, and, and mentors to me. The other was my colleague at, uh, at, 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 uh, at, at Berkeley, Sandy Kadish, uh, who, who, wrote, who began, his, began his, his, his writing about discretion as uh, written, written. So, interestingly enough, they went. They 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 interpreted their data in dramatic, you know, diametrically opposed uh, 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 directions. I I think. So so that's so that's uh, uh, that's it. The <coughs> I don't know who was who. They were, I mean, it's a big project. Somebody go and try to try to recreate the structure of CLRP, you would have the same problem. I think. I don't know who was who, but ultimately. Five big books were produced from the ABF uh, uh, survey, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it created a new type. These were these were studies. These were big pack studies showing the day-to-day -day account of the way police uh, the police uh, uh, look at a problem, the way they make arrests, and why they make arrests, the way prosecutors prosecute or decline to prosecute, and and so on, and sentencing and pro parole and probation. Five big books. 
that have had a great influence. I'll come back and say why I think that influence was was curbed a bit, but 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 they 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 had they had a great influence. Now, it can't be the case, but I don't know what else it was. None of the principles, Frank, or Lloyd Olin, or Herman, wrote any one of these big books. Here it is, they get the money, they get to do it, and then none of them writes the big central, the central that flows directly from, I don't know, maybe Frank was generous beyond a belief. In fact, when you pick up the books uh, and look at them, Frank is buried away somewhere as an editor. He's listed as an editor. So he could have been a co-author on, on, on all four of them. But it turns out, I've tracked down, and maybe Herman, you can fill in the, the blank, uh, uh, Three of, three of the authors of these big studies uh, were, were Frank's graduate students here. Frank probably recruited them and paid for them with a stipend from, 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 the, from the project funds. Another, Donald Newman, was a young assistant professor here in social work who came over and had an office in the law school and worked. And, 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 the, and the, fifth, the fifth study by a trio of people who later became very famous, but I don't know quite what their connection was. But Frank had created this big enterprise and then he really, in a sense, for an academic, didn't take, didn't take advantage. Well, this, this suggests... Uh, Frank's generosity that is legendary among everybody in this room. Well, what else? But it changed the way, it changed the way law faculty thought about the administration of justice. For the first time, they had emphasized administration and they showed there was administration and they showed the discretion permeated every stage of, uh, of, of the process. So it's had a, it had a significantly been big difference. And it, of course, made the career. You know, Frank went on to, and we now have the center here. Uh, Herman went back to be uh, the uh, administrative assistant of O.W. Wilson in uh, Chicago for a while and then came back to the faculty. And Lloyd Olin played a central role uh, in the President's Crime Commission and then, and then, uh, and then uh, went on to the Harvard Law School. Indeed, almost everybody that was involved in the ABF project Paid a uh, played a central role in the in the in, in the. But let me identify some uh, just bullet points some of the some of the uh, of the uh, 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 the contributions and impact of the study. One, it, it led directly to the establishment of the of the school uh, for uh, for criminal justice administration at SUNY Albany. Indeed, the principals were asked as a group to go there and form it. Uh, uh, only Donald uh, uh, Newman uh, went and eventually ended up and ended up being dinged. It challenged it challenged sociology, criminology, and even folks like me in political science uh, to expand our interest in criminal justice, and it transformed the way legal scholars thought about criminal justice. I invite you go up to the stacks here, read law reviews in the 1930s and 40s even the 50s, and contrast them with uh, on criminal justice and contrast them with law reviews in the 60s and 70s and 80s. It is night and day. There are plenty of exceptions, my, my, my Professor X being one of them, but you see a radically different. Indeed, one of the things we have at Berkeley now is, is uh, every now and then, there, when we have somebody on a, coming out for a job interview, uh, the, the complaint is, they just gave they just gave a doctrinal analysis, and one of my colleagues will say, "What's wrong with a doctrinal analysis every now and then?" <laughs> so I mean that's that one one didn't hear that uh, uh, even when I started at Berkeley thirty something year, years ago. Um, it had two other immediate effects. It had to be related. It had to have stimulated the Ford Foundation to make investments elsewhere. The two that I can think of, and maybe you can help me out with one of them, one is the Ford Foundation established the Police Foundation in Washington, D.C., and funded it generously for a number of years. And it was all about understanding police officers in action and trying to figure out ways, not only not so much constitutional criminal procedure, but ways to, ways to come up with command and control formulas and training manuals and other devices to manage, uh, to manage uh, police. The other was the Ford Foundation's investment in the Vera Foundation, later Vera Institute. 
think about it, criminal courts are a huge institution, different from the police, but a huge institution, and there's no research and development norm in the, in, in the criminal courts. The theory of the criminal court, the adversary system, it's a, it's a machine that goes of its own accord, right? And there's nobody to, if there's a market failure, what are you supposed to do? Well, the Vera Institute was created to intervene when there are market failures in the administration of the criminal courts. And, and, and Herb, Sturz, Herb Sturz was uh, the guy that founded that. Incidentally, tell me, Herman, you know, Herb Sturz was a graduate of the University of Wisconsin, a New York kid that came out to, to, to Wisconsin uh, as his undergraduate and then went back, went back to New York. He was a social workman. I don't know whether he, and he could have been in, in Newman's class, he could have been involved, he could have been a researcher, I don't, but somehow he got the idea, went back and kept with it, and, and the Vera Institute pioneered in two important things, bail reform, the reform of the administration, pretrial release, and in, and in pre, pretrial, pretrial desertion. However, the single biggest contribution, the single big institutional contribution of, 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 of the of AABF uh, survey was this. It set the ground, set the scene for the thinking of the President's Crime Commission that was established in 1967. Now, uh, the, not surprisingly, the big and rambunctious uh, uh, project uh, uh, here uh, took a long time, and several of the uh, several of the big books came out after the pre the Crime Commission was established. But there's no question. Not only the personnel, but the questions, more sophisticated questions, were were were. Them. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, I do say that the the uh, 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 the ABF survey. Uh, was overshadowed and overwhelmed by the President's Crime Commission. It came along and just as the ABF was producing its stuff and 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 and, and so it, it, it lost it lost some of the importance the importance that it, that, that it might other, otherwise be having. It eclipsed, it eclipsed the, the, the ABF the ABF project. It also did something more that uh, I think was his uh, tragedy is an overstatement, but but it, it did something that did not help us understand the administration of criminal justice. Uh, you're all old enough, or have you been <laughs> in the library enough, to see that great funnel of justice that is on the, the, for, the face of the, or the open up, the, it's the, 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 the folding page in the middle of, of, of one of the task force, the funnel of justice that goes in, arrests cranked in here, and convictions out there. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, the the ABF survey's nomenclature that emph that emphasized administration was supplanted by the Crime Commission's nomenclature that talked about the criminal justice system. Operations research was at its height at that time. Uh, the chair of the task force report on courts and technology, which was in fact the most innovative part of the Crime Commission, I think, was chaired by Al Blumstein himself, an operations researcher, and so he, they used the operations research. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with that, except once you're talking about a system, uh, you end up reifying things in the same way Dirk was mentioning, uh, uh, Will did. You start talking about we. We want this. We want that. We can tweak this. We can tw tweak that. We can tweak. And then we can get what we want on the output. The problem, of course, with the criminal justice system is that it is not a system. It is a, it is a, a set of separate agencies separately funded, responsible to quite different, to city, county, and state uh, 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 people who pay, pay for it, and it's chaos. <laughs> and the idea that you needed to manage this in a sensitive way, the art of management, made a lot of sense. Treating it as a system as if, we could, as if there's a machine here, we can tweak the parts and turn out what we want was, 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 a, was a, 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 great, a great mistake. Still, still, the ABF study precipitated a revolution in the study, and I think the understanding, not only by academics, but by administrators, certainly by the police, less so by courts, and certainly by corrections, that it's a complex system that, is, uh, that has to be overseen and administered, and you need to use rules and regulations as well as, uh, uh, as, well as constitutional criminal procedure to deal with it. 
I could stop there, but I want to say two things, three things more. First, I was warned. I was warned not to say a word about 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 uh, about the clinical programs here, but I can't resist one. So, uh, my colleagues and my students at Berkeley still come in excited about ways to bring constitutional challenges in juvenile court and this and that. Go up to the Frank Remington Center here and you see plaques from the Department of Justice or from the Department of, uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of Youth Authority and they thank, they thank Wisconsin folks for, being, for interning in those offices. Frank emphasized administration, not litigation, and it makes a big difference. This is why you have a better uh, juvenile court system and, 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 and correction system than, than California and most places in the state. Secondly, perhaps, perhaps Frank's single biggest individual contribution to this law school and to the state of Wisconsin and to administer and and to the, and to criminal justice reform across the United States and around the world was the appointment of this man, Herman Goldstein. Herman Gold, I have been in half a dozen countries. I've been in Israel. I've been in I've been I've been in, in, in Japan. I've been in France. And when the when folks hear that I know. Herman Goldstein, it's like they want to touch me. <laughs> Herman, in, in Japan, in Japan, they have an idea of a national living treasure. We should all have that in our states. If we had it in this state, there's no question that Herman, you would be a national living treasure. Let me give one example. Uh, my old friend Larry 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 Sherman uh, wrote a re wrote a, re a, a book review when problem uh, oriented policing came out. He said, "Look, this is the best book on the police since Patrick Cahoon's uh, treatise on the police of the metropolis." Larry himself is a well-known, well-regarded, he's now the director of the Institute of Criminology at Cambridge University. Uh, he got it about right. It's not the second best book, it is the best book, Herman. And so I want to end in, 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 in that note. Now, let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me end where I began by saying Professor X, the unknown Professor X that I talked about, <laughs> should have spent some time in Wisconsin. He just would have been a better scholar. Uh, secondly, I want to thank you so much for coming back, uh, for, for inviting me back here uh, uh, to, uh, to, 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 the, to this event. I spent seven happy years across the hall, I mean across the mall here in, in, um, in, in, in North Hall in political science department and when I came I was warmly invited by people in political science, Joe Grossman and others, but I was also, I was also welcomed, welcomed by a huge cadre of people in the law school. David Trubeck, Louise Trubeck, Frank, uh, uh, Will, Herman, obviously, uh, uh, Joel Handler, Tom Heller, uh, Howie, Howie Erlanger, uh, Walter Dickey, and Bill Clune, and Bill Whitford, and many, many others. So, so I feel like this, is, this was my second home here at the, at the, at the, uh, at the, uh, at, at, uh, uh, when, I, when, when I was here. So I want, I, I want to thank you so much for, uh, uh, for that. Uh, incidentally, we've only, I've only sent you three people back from Berkeley, <laughs> two of whom we snatched back already. I, think. <laughs> I sent you Katie Alveston and Lauren Edelman and, 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 uh, and, uh, and Alex Huneas. Uh, I'll see Alex uh, later. Uh, we, we've gotten KT and, KT and, oh, and, 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 and Carl Shoemaker, yes. So, but so, so, uh, uh, we, we, so uh, uh, it's not quite fair, but who plays fair in academics? <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Malcolm. And here's a few comments from Professor Cecilia Klingley. Thank you. I want to make sure you all get a, at least a few minutes to ask questions. So I'm going to keep my remarks very, very brief. Um, first, thank you. Um, and I want to give a report, um, somewhat like Mitra's um, report, on the current state of legal history here at the law school, only mine is a, a different kind of report to make. 
Although I don't believe there are quite as many national awards in Frank Remington's name as there are in Willard Hurst's, that doesn't mean that his influence isn't felt throughout the Academy, um, nationally, globally, and especially here at Wisconsin. Um, his humility in not putting his name on those ABF books maybe is reflected in the fact that younger scholars may not know his name as well, um, but we feel the changes that he made in the criminal justice system. I myself am very, very fortunate um, not to have known Frank, but to feel like I know him because we have such a clear school of thought that is really derived from the mentoring that he did of his students and his colleagues who very clearly and carefully have passed down that tradition um, to people like me who are fortunate enough to study here at Wisconsin for our law degrees and that my current colleagues and I try our best uh, to hand on to the students who are before us today. When I was thinking about the difference between the way we teach criminal justice here at Wisconsin and how it's taught uh, at many national schools that think of themselves as more traditional or doctrinal, I thought that really doctrinal law, uh, it approaches the study of law itself um, by looking at the order and the rules that law imposes on the complexity of human behavior. The difference is that our approach doesn't look at the order we start with the chaos. <laughs> and we say that the question to be asked is whether <coughs> the rules are bringing the order they intended. And to look for intentionally the ways in which the laws are not operating in the ways they were intended, to seek out the unintended consequences, and to ask questions about what that means about the shape and order of law itself. It's probably for that reason, um, maybe a little depressingly to me, that every semester my students say their favorite part of the criminal justice class isn't some brilliant thing that I said or shared or some reading we did, but the ride-alongs they do with police officers in the field. The learning is in the chaos, it's in the mess, and that's where they become more mature scholars and practitioners. I would also say that the tradition of Frank Remington continues for those of us on the teaching faculty. I think the lessons that have been imparted on us are that it's not enough to impress academic colleagues with brilliant, clear ideas. If we can't present those ideas to people on the front lines of justice, to police officers and probation officers and correctional folks, uh, and get their buy-in that what we're saying resonates in a meaningful way, we're missing the mark. It's that focus on trying to be authentic to the experience on the ground of the justice system that I think combined with the Wisconsin idea and Frank Remington's contributions in that area that have made his legacy enduring, not only for students and not only for scholars, but also for the actual administration of justice um, in this state and beyond. It's the fact that those who study and continue his tradition are able to speak the language of those who run our system that makes us continue continuing resources to them, whether they be legislators or correctional officials or policing agencies. And for that, we owe Frank Remington a really big debt and I think should be continually asking ourselves how we're going to continue that tradition um, when the direct memory of him uh, uh, stops, but we, we don't have any more second class relics, like, uh, or, uh, <laughs> second or third, relics. second generation, true. So, um, many thanks again, and I'm going to hand it back to Bill. Okay, uh, let me just thank both, uh, all the speakers, uh, but uh, particularly Dirk and Malcolm. Uh, we certainly got more than we paid for, which is just a plane ticket. Uh, well, I, and I, as somebody who lived this era, uh, much of what you said resonated in the sense I understood it, but you made me reflect on it, each of you. I know more about myself, in a way, or my experience, because of the reflections that you're coming, and I really appreciate the work you put into those papers. 
Uh, we're running a bit behind. Uh, we <laughs> promised we'd be done by two. Uh, we're not, we can stay. Uh, Professor Sharafi has to leave here in a few minutes, but we can, otherwise can stay and have a Q&A session. But I want to give everybody uh, permission to just leave as you need to without seeming rude. I also, before I ask for Q&A, I'll identify these mysterious sons of Frank <laughs> Remington that Malcolm referred to. Uh, Michael and Frank Remington Jr. are sitting back here. Do you want to stand so everybody can see who they are? You, you guys just want to stand so everybody... Mike and Frank, can you just stand so everybody knows? Just, uh, that's who they are. Uh, 